Well, hello everyone. I'm glad you're, you're here uh, today. Um, my name's Brian Sakula, and I'm probably going to walk around a little bit because it's hard for me to, to stay still. And what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, type 2 diabetes. And um, this is my favorite topic to talk about. And what we're going to talk about today, kind of, and I've got an, uh, one of the slides has an agenda, a few bullet points on it as an agenda. But kind of the, the, the two big things we're going to talk about is our, our current approach to treatment. Can everyone hear me okay? Our current approach to treatment and, and what's wrong with it. And then I'm going to give you some, some steps that you can follow to help improve your condition. And those steps are directly related to why there's a problem that I'll talk about in the, the first part of my um, uh, presentation. A, a couple things to note. One, I'm recording the audio from this, and, it, and we're going to have it processed, and it should be processed by Friday. And, and then Tia is going to get a copy of that and put it where? Oh, you'll send it, she'll send it out to you guys, so if you guys wanted to uh, have my greatness on your phone, you can download it and put it on your, your phone. We'll also put it on your, our website, so anyone else that wants to, to, to get it, what, we'll be able to get it to. There's uh, notepads on your tables if you want to write down anything or take notes, and also in case you didn't know, there's a sign-in sheet back there on the, the counter, so you can... Uh, get your name signed in in case you uh, like credit for being here. So what we're going to talk about today is type 2 diabetes and why I think, and if you look at the research, um, there's a lot of people that think everyone should act like they're a type 2 diabetic. And this is exactly why. You don't have to know what this graph shows because I'll talk about it later. But what's important to note is this quote that comes directly from that article, and it says this right here, an age-related clinical event developed in approximately one out of three healthy individuals in the upper tertile of insulin resistance. Does anyone know what a tertile is? No so in research, they take however many people there are and divide them into three groups. One group is a tertile. So in the upper tertile, or the top third, uh, at baseline, whereas none, no, uh, or zero clinical events were observed in the most insulin sensitive tertile. And this will make sense in a little bit, but I just wanted to kind of give you some uh, foreshadowing of what we're going to talk about. And a couple things I, I'm going to mention I talk about the microphone, the notes, the sign in sheet. So we've already kind of uh, talked about that. But here's kind of our outline and uh, agenda. I'll tell you a little bit about me and maybe why you would or wouldn't or should or shouldn't listen to what I have to say. We'll talk about what type 2 diabetes mellitus is, why this is an issue, and then what you can do if you have this condition or if you know someone that has this condition. Because if, if you look at the data, the, the statistics in this country, and if you put Every adult that either has diabetes, is at risk for diabetes, or has a family history of diabetes, that's over 50% of the adult population. So the likelihood that you know someone is very high. And it's a bad deal. It's so bad, in fact, that if we don't do something as a, a country, as a, as a population, that our whole healthcare system is going to be swallowed up by type 2 diabetes. Currently, type 2 diabetes is the most expensive condition to have and treat. More expensive than cancer. And it's only going to get worse unless we do something majorly and, and drastic to have a significant impact on that. Uh, so a little bit about me. My education, I have a PhD in, in physiology and statistics from the University of Houston. Uh, in terms of work, 
when I was in graduate school working on my PhD, and then soon after I finished, I worked at NASA Johnson Space Center, and I worked in the Space and Life Sciences Division, and I worked in the area of astronaut health, which was a good transition to this. Uh, and we looked at things like circulatory system and zero gravity. Uh, after that, I took a job at the University of Houston and got tired of working for the federal and state government and started this company 13 years ago this month, the Health Performance Institute. Uh, in terms of personal, I'm married. I have um, two teenage daughters. Uh, one of them just moved out this past Saturday because she went to college, and the other one is a sophomore. So she's about three, three years from moving out. So what is type 2 diabetes? Anybody want to, there's, I'm not going to make fun of you or tease you if, you if you get it wrong. Does anybody want to take a guess as to what type 2 diabetes is? I, I shouldn't say guess. When Give me an answer. When your body doesn't produce enough insulin. Anybody have anything? Yes. Uh, but it's not a natural condition from birth. It's something you develop over time. Something you develop over time, type 2 diabetes, yes. Anybody else have anything to, to add? Yes. Oh, you were not raising your hand? <laughs> if you have this condition, what does your doctor talk to you about? They talk to you about your blood sugar, right? The level of how high your blood sugar gets. They give you medication to control your blood sugar. They talk about controlling it within the recommended ranges, get, get it between, below, you know, depending on where you are when you start. And if you're at 300, then they want you to get below 200 and then, uh, you know, 150 and then close to, to 100. But everything is targeted as if this is a problem with blood sugar. And it's not a problem with blood sugar. Blood sugar is a symptom of the problem. The real problem, does anyone know a person that has type 1 diabetes? What is type 1 diabetes? Do you want to answer? Their body doesn't produce insulin, so they have to walk around with a pump. Type 2 diabetes is a problem with insulin that doesn't work. Your body produces it, it just doesn't work, which is why your blood sugar goes up. That's the reason your blood sugar is elevated, but you're taking medication to lower it, and the medication doesn't help your insulin. And so when your medication runs out because nothing's being done to improve insulin resistance, you need to refill your medication because there's been nothing done to fix the problem. So you always have to refill it. And long term, when you don't fix that problem, it leads to other problems. How many of you can think back, I've been in Houston for 15 or 20 years, how many dialysis clinics did you see 15 years ago? Not very many. Now you don't even have to look to find them. They're almost like Starbucks on every corner. And that's a direct result of our inability to treat the condition. We're just keeping people sick. We're managing their condition and not fixing it. And when you Think of it look, at it, look at it from that perspective, it's also expensive. You know, I said earlier, type 2 diabetes, this is personal expenses uh, if you're into fact checking, and if you have a medical background, you can go to the Journal, Journal of American Medical Association, down there is the, the link to that. But out of 155 conditions, over a 14 year period, type 2 diabetes was the most expensive condition to have and to treat. Look at it, $101.4 billion, $101 billion compared to all types of cancers, $87.6 billion. Does anybody want to guess as to why that's the case? Because all you hear about on the news, no one hears about on the news how expensive insulin is. 
right? But if you have type 2 diabetes, or if you have type 1 diabetes, and if you take insulin, you know how expensive insulin is. But it's never talked about on the news. We hear about cancer drugs that are $10,000, $200,000. We don't hear about that with diabetes. But the reason diabetes is more expensive is because we have the volume of people that have type 2 diabetes, and they can live a long time with it. And they can suffer. If you know anyone that's had amputations or vision loss, uh, I can talk about these things because uh, it directly impacted me with my mom. Uh, if you know anyone from the last four or five years of their life that had type 2 diabetes, it's not very nice. And it certainly isn't cheap. Having legs cut off, vision problems, all of that stuff builds up over time. And that's why it's so expensive. Now, how does this uh, affect companies? Well, I didn't mention this in the beginning, but HPI, Health Performance Institute, we primarily contract with companies to do programs like this to help their people that are at risk for diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or have these conditions. And we help them by keeping them from being diagnosed, or if they're diagnosed, we help get them off their medications. This is a typical scenario that you may see in terms of type 2 diabetes related costs in every company that you look at if you look at their data. Say they have 5,000 employees, they'll have about 1,000 that are diagnosed as type 2 diabetic, that's diagnosed. So you're going to have a big chunk that are walking around undiagnosed, and you'll have a big chunk that are walking around as pre-diabetic. Of that 1,000, uh, approximately 400 will be on insulin. Now, at the approximate cost of $400 per month per prescription of insulin, the average company is spending almost $2 million a year on one drug. And some industries are worse than others. So it's a major, uh, major issue. And when you combine that with our inability to fix the problem from a medical perspective, it's not going anywhere. It's just going to get worse. So why do we want to act like, why, why, why am I recommending that everyone act like they're a type 2 diabetic? I'm going to explain that graph that I had up here at the, at the very beginning. Uh, when we diagnose people with type 2 diabetes, here's kind of the criteria that is used from a medical perspective. Sorry, I feel, if I, if you feel oh, like no, no, no. I got my back to you over here. Uh, so for type 2 diabetes, if, we go, if you look on the left, uh, fasting blood sugar uh, for type 2 diabetes is a, a fasting blood sugar of 126 or greater. For prediabetes, it's between 100 and 125, and for normal, it's 99 and below. Okay, the important thing there is 99 and below. If you're a type 2 diabetic or maybe even a type 1 diabetic, you may be familiar with the number on the right, that's HbA1c or just A1c, and that's a number that indicates kind of average blood sugar control over the previous you know, 60 to 90 days, depending on which test they used. And you can see the percentages uh, there. Six and a half or above is, corresponds to type 2 diabetic. 5.7 to 6.4 would be type uh, uh, pre-diabetes, and 5.6 and below is normal. So if you're diabetic, you've probably had this tested or seen this on your report or had your doctor talk to you about it. So earlier I said, when we had that little conclusion paragraph up there, I said, does anyone know what a tertile is? So what we did, or what they did, is they took people that had a normal blood sugar and a normal BMI, which means they weren't overweight. They were normal weight or lower. And they had a, low, a, a normal blood sugar. And then they put them through an insulin resistance test. And this comes up with a score. It's called the HOMA score. 
H-O-M-A. Uh, if you have type 2 diabetes, you may have heard that, uh, but you see it a lot in, in the research. But what they did was, based on that score, <clears throat> they divided them into three groups, low, medium, and high insulin resistance. And so insulin resistance, high insulin resistance, would indicate a greater risk for type 2 diabetes. So they put them in those three groups and followed, and here's some of the, uh, uh, the criteria that they used to allow people to be in the group. So BMI was less than 30, which is they could have been overweight but not obese. Uh, no history of high blood pressure, resting blood pressure of 145 or over 90 and lower. Uh, and then, you know, everything else was, was normal. So they put these people into three different groups and followed them for uh, 6.3 years on average and monitored them for clinical outcomes. And what they called clinical outcomes were cardiovascular type events. And here's what they found. This is that graph that I was talking about at the very beginning. The people that had the best insulin sensitivity or the lowest insulin resistance, meaning their insulin worked the best, in six years they had zero diagnosis. The people that had the worst had the highest amount of diagnoses. And then in the middle, it was kind of in the middle. So the message here is that you want to maintain insulin sensitivity as best as you can. Because remember, type 2 diabetes, blood sugar isn't the problem. That's a symptom of the problem. Your blood sugar is rising or elevating because your insulin is not working. So here, here's a little pop quiz to see how uh, well you've been paying attention or maybe how well you can, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Speculate's not the right word, but something like that. Uh, here's the top five conditions that people were diagnosed with at follow-up from, from that group. Type two diabetes, high blood pressure, coronary heart disease, cancer, and stroke. Of those five conditions, what do you think was most frequently diagnosed based upon their insulin resistance category. I'm sorry? Type 2 diabetes? Type 2 diabetes? Anybody have any other guess? Educated guesses, that's the word I was looking for. Um, that would be the wrong answer. High blood pressure was the most frequently diagnosed condition based upon insulin resistance category. So the worse your insulin resistance was, but it was still normal, the greater your risk for developing high blood pressure within six years. Look at number two on the list. Cancer. You ever hear these statistics where people say, if you have diabetes, your risk for cancer is eight times higher than the normal person. It's true, and this is evidence of it. So if you have high blood pressure, maybe you've really got a problem with insulin resistance that's not manifesting itself as diabetes, but it's showing up as high blood pressure. Type 2 diabetes was fourth on the list. Three things were diagnosed more frequently than diabetes in, in six years based upon a grouping of insulin resistance. That's pretty amazing. It's also maybe <laughs> a little disturbing when you realize that it's not just type 2 diabetes. So with all this stuff, what do you need to do? Well, I need, I, I'm going to tell you that you can't be um, the regular old sheep in the crowd. Because the sheep in the crowd get bad information and bad advice. You're going to have to do things differently, and you're going to have to buckle yourself against criticism, and you're going to have to do things very differently than what your doctor may tell you, uh, what a, certainly what a certified diabetes educator would tell you. You're not going to be able to listen to the American Diabetic Association 
You're not going to be able to do any of those things if you want to get better. That's number one. And number two, if you think you're helping yourself by taking medication and, and controlling your blood sugar within the normal limits, you're not. You need to change your behavior so that your body can control blood sugar by improving insulin resistance so that then you're less reliant on medication. As we've said, as we beat the dead horse repeatedly today, taking medication doesn't fix the problem. And it doesn't decrease your risk. No matter what your doctor says, the research would suggest otherwise. So you're gonna have to do things differently. And that's what we do with the Academy and the things I'm about to start telling you to do come directly from that program. So if you wanna know what to do, get your pen out and your notepad ready. So in the Academy, we teach people the right kind of food to eat, how to sleep better, how to manage stress, and how to exercise. And I'm gonna to touch on each of those here. Food. Does that look like a good meal to eat? It looks pretty tasty, huh? If you haven't eaten lunch and it's making you hungry, I apologize. So what your meals need to be, every meal needs to be primarily protein, fat, and vegetables, and very limited amount of starch based upon how your blood sugar, how your blood sugar responds to the starch that you eat. By volume of food, if, if we put like, um, protein on one table, vegetables on another table, and starch on another table, the vegetables table should be overflowing in volume. The starch table, you don't even need a table because of what it does to your blood sugar. And then the protein table, you know, that's a, that's a variable that's different for every person and how much they need to eat based on body size, gender, activity level, extent of your uh, insulin resistance. But generally speaking, people need to be um, now this, I'm going to say this, and, and I don't mean that you can't do this by being a vegetarian. It's easier to not be a vegetarian and fix your type 2 diabetes because you need a certain amount of amino acids and it's hard not to eat starch and get all the necessary amino acids that your body needs. You can do it, it's just harder. So if you're going to eat meat, which just makes this whole thing easier to do. Most people that we've talked to that have been through our program eat anywhere from eight ounces to a pound and a half of meat per day. And if you eat all that in one meal, fine. If you do it over three meals, fine too. Good notes? All right. Sleep. If you have a dog, you know that dogs can sleep all the time. So how, the question is, how do we get to sleep like our dog? The, the main problem with us and sleep is, if, and also if you're type 2 diabetic, uh, blood sugar makes, your, makes it more difficult for your body to metabolize melatonin. Melatonin is your main sleep hormone. So when blood sugar's up, getting to sleep is difficult. And when you're type 2 diabetic, you're always struggling with elevated blood sugar. So sleeping is always going to be an issue. So what do you need to do? First, for, for optimal sleep, you need to not eat any, eat any snacks that will disrupt your blood sugar two hours before bed. Three hours if you have poor blood sugar control. But two hours is, is optimal. Question? How can you repeat that? Repeat. Yeah, two hours before bed. Two hours before bed. So uh, don't eat anything that will disrupt your blood sugar. So if you eat like a boiled egg, 
that's not going to disrupt your blood sugar or it'll do it just very minimally. But don't eat anything that will raise your blood sugar two, hour before, two hours before bed because that blood sugar is going to interrupt with your body's ability to, to metabolize melatonin. And then the other thing you want to do is an hour before bed, put away your cell phone, stop watching TV, and, and turn off the bright lights in your house and leave some lighter lights on. Because guess what? Exposure to backlit devices and ceiling lights tricks our brain into thinking the sun is still up. And so your brain starts suppressing melatonin production. So you've got snacking habits that keep our body from metabolizing it, and then you've got light exposure habits that keep our body from producing it. So you've got two things combined that make it harder to sleep. So decrease your exposure to lights the last hour before bed. Those two things should help you start sleeping better right away. Now, what, what do we recommend for stress? Well, there's no way you can eliminate it. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, I, from a physiological perspective, some stress is good. It's just when it's chronic that it's not very good. The, the most effective ways that people that have been through our program have told us that um, has helped them manage stress is by listening to uh, calm and soothing music throughout the day, like classical music on your computer. Uh, in, 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 uh, on our Facebook page, there's a Start Here post, and there's a link to a website called calm.com, C-A-L-M.com. It's totally free, uh, and we have a tutorial on our website on how to, how to use it. But something like that, or you know, YouTube, if, if you can get, get access to it from, from work, listen to some classical music playlists in the background. And when you listen to those, lis listen to them loud enough so that you can hear them, but they don't interrupt your ability to work. And it's very relaxing and very calming. And then the second, um, most effective thing that people report is uh, they stop watching the news. <laughs> I don't know how much uh, attention you're paying to the news right now, uh, but even if you don't think subconsciously, it's, it's making you mad. And so if you just stop watching it, you'll feel much better. And now the fourth thing is exercise. Now, any kind of exercise is good. But if you want to improve your condition, there are certain things you need to do. If you look at the average type 2 diabetic, not the average type 2 diabetic, every type 2 diabetic, their body's ability to burn fat tissue is compromised. So you want to exercise in a way so that you get better at burning fat. And some exercises don't do that. And some do. The best form of exercise that helps your body burn fat is walking. So you need to walk, and then you need to walk and walk some more. So your goal, your first goal, is to, get sh to make sure that you get consistent in walking at least five days a week. Goal number two is to increase how long you walk. And the objective is at least 45 minutes at a, at a time. This nonsense of 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night is helpful. It's nonsense for type 2 diabetics. And the reason it's nonsense is because your body struggles to burn body fat or fat tissue. And it takes at least 25 minutes for a diabetic to get to where they can burn fat. So if you walk 20 minutes, you're not doing enough productive work. It doesn't mean you shouldn't walk for 20 minutes if you can, but it's not as helpful as 45 minutes because you want to be able to walk longer so that you can stay in that fat burning mode longer. So work your way up to walking consistently 
and then walking for longer periods of time. And like I said earlier, you're going to have to be the red pea in the green pod. You're going to have to do things differently. This kind of diet is counter to what people will tell you to do. If you follow that diet for 60 days, 100%, and then if you take your food and log it into MyFitnessPal or something like that, and if you did the calorie breakdown, your calories are going to be about 50 to 55% from fat, about 20 and 25, and then the other 20 and 25% from protein and carbohydrates. So that's the part where you have to be different than what we said. And you're going to need a strong back because as soon as you leave this presentation and get out of here, everything is against you being successful. Everything. From the grocery store and the, where, the way items are placed and what you're supposed to buy to the message you hear on TV to your nosy neighbor sticking her nose in your business telling you that you shouldn't eat that much protein, it's going to mess up your cholesterol. Everyone knows someone like that. But that's what you've got to do if you want to get better. And it's going to be uh, <clears throat> constant and all the time. You may even hear it from your certified diabetes educator. Your doctor probably won't tell you that because they want you to get better. They just don't have time to sit there and tell you what to do. And if you start tracking your blood sugar and start doing these things, and start getting better, he or she will be happy for you. And in the 13 years we've been doing this, I've had one doctor that was mad at what we were telling people to do. One. And we've been averaging 12 to 1,500 people per year going through the academy. <laughs> oh, oh, so uh, 50 to 55 percent fat. And then whatever's left should be fairly equal between carbohydrates and starch and protein. Yeah. So based on all that, what's the worst aisle to go down in the grocery store? The answer is there is no one answer. The potato chip aisle, the bread aisle, the cereal, the bakery. Who, whose favorite grocery store is HEB? What is HEB? HEB does a great job of designing their stores and they funnel you. You go through the produce and where do they dump you out? They dump you out at the break bakery where they've got that homemade tortilla machine and then the bread coming out, and the donuts. <laughs> Maybe a better question is, what's a safe spot in the grocery store? <laughs> Online. <laughs> uh, meat and produce. Uh, and if you're a diabetic that tracks your blood sugar, you know that a lot of fruits will even elevate your blood sugar. The best fruits are those that have berry in their name. Blueberry, raspberry, blackberry. And the reason is because those fruits also have a lot of fiber, which cancels out sugar during the, the digestive process. So you're going to have to remember that everything is conspiring against you. It's not just about the calories that you eat. It's the kind of food that you eat. And unfortunately, that's not the message. But if you can stick to that, if you can do it, you're going to be the happy person. And people that are mad at you or telling you you're, you're wrong, guess what? In five years, they're still going to be pissed off and miserable, and you're not going to be. So don't worry about that. Just keep doing it. In fact, it's probably, if you have this condition or are at risk for get this condition, I would submit that it's your responsibility to fix it for your sake and your family's sake. 
And listening to the standard prescription isn't going to help you at all. Yes, ma'am. What is your take on alcohol? What is my? So did you guys hear her question? What is my uh, response to alcohol? So there's, you kind of have to answer that question from two perspectives. One is when you're a type two diabetic that has had uh, problems controlling his or her blood sugar, it also means your liver is getting hammered every day. And so your liver is what processes alcohol. Now, if you start doing these kinds of things and start helping your liver, then I think alcohol is okay uh, in moderation. Uh, I hate the word moderation, but in alcohol, it's, uh, it's one place I'll use it. Um, but I wouldn't drink, I mean, there, I, would, I would only drink a few kinds of wine and spirits. Beer is not really helpful or productive on your liver at all. But, you know, white wine, red wine, and, and the drier the better, because the lower in sugar it is. And then spirits. And, and, and the, uh, the interesting thing is, I don't know if it's interesting, but you know, kind of a sidebar. The, the more you spend on alcohol, the, the higher quality it tends to be and less problematic it will be unless you drink the whole bottle. That's a, that's a separate issue. <laughs> but there's a reason when you go to Specs or when we were in college, you would call it bottom shelf tequila, right? Or any bottom shelf anything. There's a reason you call it bottom shelf. And the, the higher up you get on the shelf, the, the cleaner it is. But it's also more expensive. Uh, um, scotch, bourbon, tequila, rum, anything that fits in that whiskey kind of category. Uh, like I said earlier, you can, uh, if you wanted to enroll, you can enroll in our program. We do this with companies. So if you're uh, on the banking side here with commercial clients, um, this would be very helpful for them, particularly if they're self-funded, a program like ours, because the bigger they get, uh, the more problem diabetes, no more problems type two diabetes causes in their insurance uh, plan. Uh, and if you sign up as an individual, what you can do here and there's two different options. There's one that's completely online and there's one where we have a, a monthly uh, recorded uh, Skype or uh, FaceTime uh, coaching session where we record those and store them on a special site for you on our website. If you do any of those as an individual, we offer you a 100% money back guarantee. If you follow what we tell you to do and, and you don't, get off your medications or, or achieve your goals, we'll give you your money back. And, and just to kind of bolster your confidence a little bit, in the last six years that we've been tracking insulin usage, type two diabetics that have also been on insulin that have gone through our program, 100% have gotten off insulin by following advice that we cover in this program that I just talked about for a few minutes uh, earlier. And in the academy, we've got recipes, videos, articles. We have a Facebook group that we're, um, we're starting to uh, employ a little bit more, a private Facebook group, um, and all kinds of everything you need to, uh, to know. So how can you get a hold of me besides that? Uh, online, uh, on the left, online is our, our two main websites, and we have membership websites that are not up there. Um, on the bottom left is email, and on the right is uh, social media. There's, uh, the first one's me on LinkedIn. Uh, I published an art, I've had an article published, well not published, but waiting to be published on LinkedIn for about three weeks. I finally got the guts to hit publish today. Um, I called Warren Buffett a jackass uh, in this article, but I, I published it, I took out jackass and changed it to evil. But the reason I said that is because he's got almost $50 billion in holdings 
from Berkshire Hathaway that run the spectrum of type 2 diabetes. Food and beverage, fast food, pharmaceuticals. One of his pharmaceutical companies is Sanofi SA. I don't know what the SA stands for. But Sanofi makes Lantus. Lantus, Lantus was number 9 or 10 in the entire world in revenue in 2016 uh, in selling uh, uh, gross revenues. And then he's the largest stakeholder in DaVita. So on one hand, he's feeding you Coke, McDonald's, and other snack foods. In the middle, he's giving you medication to control your diabetes. And then on the back end, he's, he's taking money from you to go to DaVita to get dialysis. What's that? Yes. Yeah. And he's never going to... I mean, he knows that, but if he, if he did something to fix that, he would, that would be detrimental to him. So there's our social media um, stuff. The, the, the bottom one there is uh, our Facebook page. There's about 17 or 18,000 page likes that we have people following us. So you can um, join along with them and we post something every day except for Sundays. And it's all related to the academy or news that we find interesting or any kind of stuff like that. Very helpful stuff. Uh, and if you go there and like the page, there's a, a pinned post that's got a bunch of stuff related, free stuff there. You can check that out too. Uh, and thank you. Any questions? Yeah. I'll be happy to answer them. Yes. So describe the program itself. If you're going, if you have type 2 diabetes, you're going to a doctor, you're, you're going through this program. To this program. To this program. Yep. How does the program work? Are you seeing a physician? What's the interconnectivity between the program and the physician you are seeing? All right. So her question was, what, how does the program connect with uh, your own personal physician? And... Presumably, a follow-up question is, how do you get off your medications uh, and that kind of stuff? So the, the answer to that question is, we don't connect with your doctor at all. We don't have any influence on them. If they want to talk to us, we will talk to them. The, the, the program works. There's the academy. There's 12 modules. And when, when a person signs up, you sign up, you get access to module one today. And then in two weeks, you'll get access to module one and two. And in, in two weeks, you'll get access to module three. And it goes through till all 12 modules are done. But at each module, there's what we call a module guide that tells you exactly step by step what to do. And you do all these things in terms of food or whatever. And it's basically these recommendations that I covered today. But it's telling you exactly what to do to improve your condition. And we encourage people diabetics to track their blood sugar so that when they go see their doctor if things are changing then they can talk about well and if you come back in six more months if this is consistent or better we'll talk about getting off your your medication and that's how that works um, in fact just I think last week or two weeks ago we had three people that were uh, in the program that uh, their doctor took them off of Genuvia. If you're, if you're on Genuvia and if you have to pay for it, that's expensive uh, too. But that's between them and their doctor. But when people become their own advocate and start doing what we talk about, start tracking their blood sugar numbers, we have, like I said earlier, we've only had one doctor complain. Most doctors get into medicine because they want to help people. They just get jaded after being in the system so long. But when a patient comes in that's taking advantage of, of their situation and doing something about it, they tend to get excited and like that. And so if they know that you're wanting to do this, they'll work with you as well. That's been our experience for 13 years now. You also mentioned when you were describing the food that part of it might be a little starch. Uh -huh. Yep. Like what? 
<laughs> so uh, did you guys hear her question? What would consider to be a little starch or a little carb? Um, in the very beginning, the starch is optional for type 2 diabetics, uh, which is what we're talking about here today. And if you're going to eat it, we recommend two things. One, to measure your blood sugar uh, after the meal or two hours after your meal and make sure your blood sugar is not over 150. If it's over 150, then eat less starch or eliminate it. In the very beginning of the program, the only starch we recommend is potato. And there's a bunch of reasons for that, but <clears throat> in terms of satisfying your hunger levels and, and what your body needs from a nutritional perspective, a half a pound of potato contains about 50 grams of carbs and it's very satisfying. And so that's why we recommend potato and half a pound potato. I'm sorry? Yeah. The glycemic index, yeah. So his question is, what is about the glycemic index? That's why we want you to monitor your blood sugar. If it goes too high, don't eat it until your blood sugar starts to come down naturally. And then that means that you're improving insulin resistance. And then that means your body can better handle a little bit at a time. Someone in the back, yes. Uh, your uh, modules, are they customized to the So um, the, the modules are, so her question was, are the modules customized to the person? The, the modules have recommendations in them. And then within those, it says if you're diabetic, do this. If you have high blood pressure, do this. If you have high cholesterol, do this. I don't know if that is, um, that's how they're customizable. The recommendations are geared towards everybody that's in it. And then there's uh, specific guidelines or recommendations uh, based upon if whatever condition you have. Um, our target market is people that are at risk or have been diagnosed with these things. So almost everybody has um, either is at risk or, or has these conditions. Uh, and then I forgot your second question, sorry. Um, I think You know, based upon what I was talking about earlier, in terms of when I said, okay, take your notes out, here's what you should be doing for food. When you eat in such a way that you feed your body and it gets less hungry, cravings go away. Okay, that's number one. The other part, that's the physical part. The mental part of cravings is really habitual and not much more than that. Getting dessert after dinner is a habit more than an addiction. And it's really a problem when we don't eat foods that feed our body. So if you eat foods that feed your body, it's easier to break that habit. And then we also have recommendations, like there's no dessert in module one, but starting in module two, you can have dessert. But there are some caveats to that. So for example, you must eat a dinner, it can only be at night, you must eat a dinner that's compliant with our recommendations and you've got to wait 30 minutes. Why would we do that? Well, food that feeds your body takes a while to digest. And when during that period of time you're digesting that food and it's gonna be sending signals constantly to your brain, okay, we're full. This is exa exactly the phenomenon everyone has felt when they go to a nice steakhouse to celebrate something, they finish their meal and then two minutes later they're pounding, you know, a piece of cake that's big as a plate and then they get home an hour later and they're freaking miserable, right? Why did I do that? Well, you didn't give your body time to tell you you were full and so you just kept eating. But that's, that's what we, so is it hard to do? I don't know. I, I tend to think, look, if, 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 if you're in this position, you're putting yourself and your family and a whole bunch of things at risk. Uh, is, it, is it hard to do? Um, not really, 
but it's also something you have to do, so it's kind of immaterial. More questions, yes? I didn't hear you. Can you say it again? Well, it depends on how you... So his question was, do, do we cure diabetes or, or improve the condition? Um, most doctors will tell you that you can't cure it. And th that's really um, um, you know, a phenomenon of uh, the electrical, electronic medical records, the EMRs and those kinds of things, and, and, and tracking for insurance and, and, and other perspectives. My objective with this program and for every, whether they have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, or type 2 diabetes, is how does the body respond to food and does it still act like it's a type 2 diabetic? And so we're targeted at improving the condition and helping your body manage blood sugar naturally so it doesn't need medication. Whether or not you can have that label removed from your records, that's a, that's a different question. Because if you're if you remember, we had those A1C numbers up there. And if your A1C is 5.0, and it's 5.0 for, you know, two and a half years in a row, well, metabolically, you're not diabetic. But it still is probably in your records. And so what's the, you know, do, do it, what's more important for you? How your body's doing or what the records say? I mean, I know getting that stuff out of your medical records is probably important because for your own pocketbook. Um, but it, it's more important how your body's doing than that. But the reality is if you are a diabetic, you go through a program like this, you, it's in check, you've gotten off the medication, if I understand it correctly, fact is, if you return to your old habit of eating improperly, yeah. all of that, it, it, it's not going away. Right. right? Yeah, well, I mean, what, um, <coughs> right, so you still have to be mindful. You, 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 you know, you don't get to get to a point where you're off all your meds and say, phew, I'm free again. I can eat like I was, you know, a 26-year-old. Uh, big dummy in college eating pizza every night or whatever. You can't do that. You still have to be mindful of your habits and the things that you do because it's a slippery slope. Which is, brings us back to the red pea and the green pod thing. You, got, you always have to be different and be damned with anybody says or thinks. Now, certainly it would be better if you could get your spouse to do this with you. Much, much easier. Uh, Sometimes maybe you could just twist their arm or something, make them do it. Yes, ma'am. I have a few questions. Uh, as long as you're walking, but if it's high impact exercise or whatever, it doesn't matter, right? Okay. And then you don't want to go jogging. You want to do something that's either super easy or super hard. The stuff in the middle burns a lot of carbohydrates, and your body's already good at burning carbohydrates. No okay. sense in getting better at that. Um, that's a misnomer. So triglycerides in your circula in your circulating in your blood, they come from glucose that your body doesn't know what to do with. So if you can fix your body's ability to handle glucose, which is what we're trying to do with, by improving insulin sensitivity or reducing insulin resistance, your triglycerides are going to go down. Uh, so this idea that you've got that that. Our digestive system, while it kind of makes logical sense that we're, we're going to eat cholesterol and it's going to shoot up our cholesterol. We're going to eat butter and it's going to jack up our triglycerides. Our digestive system, once, once food hits our stomach and goes through our intestines and everything else, it's way more complicated than that. Is there a way to access the diet portion of it or to purchase the diet portion of it without going through the whole program? Uh, and we don't have it separate like that, but you could always just do the diet program only, diet part only. Okay. I mean, you I still have, have access to it on the website. I have adult diabetes at this point, but my dad has it, and I have gestational diabetes. 
Yeah. You're you're closer to the sip, slippery slope than the average person. Yes. <laughs> so, but, but I uh, actually was able to go through my pregnancy without medication because uh -huh. I ate every three hours. I wrote down what I ate, and it was very strict. So they they had me, you know, following carbohydrates, like counting carbs. Yeah. And but I didn't mention you counting carbs. I mentioned a percentage of your calories per yeah. day, and I'm not really sure how that would keep someone from overeating or. On, like based for, on the view, like this steak looks this much bigger than oh. potatoes. Now, well, we get to the we get to the specific numbers as we go through the program. So, um, at the very beginning, so I told you that your diet is going to end up being about fifty percent fat, right? If the first, you know, today's a little bit different because this is a lunch and learn. When we when we start working with a company, we go and do these things called info sessions where we talk specifically about the academy for an hour. And there are people just like everyone in here that needs help uh, one way or another. And if the first thing we talked about was whatever you're doing now, we're going to switch you to a diet that's 50% or more fat and then, you know, 20% protein and whatever carbohydrates. Um, people are going to shut down because there's such a conventional thought about how fat is unhealthy for us. And so certainly a diet that high in fat is going to kill me. So we don't talk about all those kinds of things at the very beginning. That's number one. Number two, the first step in the program is to eliminate processed foods. And so that's a major deal for every person on the planet, right? And so it does us no good to pile that responsibility on someone and then say, oh, start worrying about how much protein you're eating, don't eat mayonnaise or whatever. Let's get rid of this first, get used to it, and then we'll chip away at these other things. Um, so we get into all those things, and that's where the uh, pound and a, uh, half a pound, a pound and a half of protein uh, value comes from. We have charts um, that can be downloaded in the carbohydrate module that says, okay, when you eat, you know, here, whatever your daily total is, here's how you can figure that out. So not visually. And we reckon, the other reason I talked about potatoes earlier is, um, you know, I talk about the Chinese food places all the time. If you go to a Chinese food restaurant and you get their, their beef and broccoli, how much rice do they give you? A bunch. A quarter cup of cooked rice, which means it's of uncooked, which means it turns into a half cup of cooked rice, has the same amount of starch as half a pound of potato. So if you're getting three cups of rice at lunch, you're getting six times the amount you need in one day. And you're doing that in 30 minutes. And is any wonder at two o'clock you're going, man, I'm tired, dozing off in front of the computer. Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Anyone. They're all, I mean, there's some differences, but there's 95% overlap between sweet potatoes, white potatoes, yellow potatoes, and all these other uh, root potatoes that the differences don't matter at this point. Yes, ma'am. Why is walking better than running? I mean, if you're a runner, what, I mean, what, what why would walking be better? So the, uh, the, our, the basis of our recommendations and the basis of this program is to help a, a diabetic or an at-risk for diabetes metabolism get better at burning fat. Walking is, and low intensity activity like walking is like a sledgehammer on your metabolism that helps your body even at rest get better at burning fat. Jogging is a primarily carbohydrate based activity. And so if you're jogging a lot and you're struggling it could be because you're not doing enough to facilitate or help your body get better at burning fat. So that's why we have those recommendations. It's not that we're anti-jogging. It's just that people that need to lose weight shouldn't be jogging until they get their metabolism fixed. Then they can go jogging. And you can go down here to Memorial Park and probably see 80% of the people that are jogging probably would be much better served walking than jogging. 
time going through this program, how, and I realize everybody's situation is different, yeah. but based, based on what you've seen, how quickly do you see results? So her question was, how quickly do we see results? Um, so there's two, two ways I'll answer that question. Um, it depends on the kind of results you're talking about. Uh, the, most people like to lose weight, right? So the, within two weeks, the average female loses about eight pounds. The average male loses about 12 pounds. Now, um, coupled with that is no restrictions on the eating other than what we talk about. But we have these monthly questionnaires that we do for some of our groups, and they report that they're less hungry, have more energy, and their clothes are fitting better already in two weeks, which is uh, pretty remarkable. So you got that kind of, uh, of a result. And it, it, you know that's motivating too, because it keeps you going. Um, uh, and in terms of other outcomes, uh, getting off your medication and those kinds of things, I will say that <clears throat> The answer to that is it really depends on how long you've been diagnosed and taking medication. The shorter that period of time is, the quicker you'll be able to take uh, to get rid of them. Um, we have people all the time that have been diagnosed with um, type 2 diabetes, you know, six months ago, and, you know, it's the standard deal. They come out, they're taking uh, glucophage, lisinopril, and then um, Lipitor. You know, yesterday they were fine, and today they, they've got three medications. But the diabetes drug is usually gone within three months for those people. And then they work on the other stuff. The problem we run into with cholesterol is doctors, as regardless of how much they want to help people, they are very hesitant to take people off of statin drugs because they think the statins are helpful independent of any kind of uh, nasty side effects you may have. Uh, so they're, they're really hesitant to, to do that. that. Was that helpful? Um, I don't know what time it is, but I'll, I can answer some more questions. And if you want, you've got ways to get a hold of me. I've got some business cards up here on the desk as well. More questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so uh, we have a module that's, called, that's dedicated to fats. It's called the, just the fats module. And um, the, the subtitle is fats to eat and fats to cook with. And for those things, we just concentrate on things like olive oil and coconut oil and butter and lard and tallow. And so we're talking about the things that you add to food or cook with. See you later, Rob. Uh, so that's what we consider uh, as fats. And those are things that are... Uh, dietary fats, things that we consume. If they're part of an egg or part of the cheese or part of the meat or part of the yogurt or whatever else, um, <clears throat> those certainly are part of the deal, but those aren't the fats that we talk about when we're talking about cooking or, or eating. Avocado considered a fat that you're adding to? Uh, no, we call that a fruit because technically that's a fruit. Okay. But it's the it's one of the best foods you could eat, even though it's high in fat. Any more questions? Man, you guys asked a lot of good questions. Even from the back, they always if people in the back ask questions, that's a good presentation. Brian, you're going to be you're going to be at our upcoming health fair. Yes. As well, which is next month. September 26th from 10 to 2. So he'll be here for that. Yeah, or tell anybody that missed an awesome presentation to come talk to me there. Exactly. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I'm sorry? Insurance? Like for no, do we accept insurance? No. No. Out of pocket. She in Utah? She's in Utah, yes. So we're still looking into it. But this is what we do when, when we do it with, at the corporate level. We put people in groups like this. Uh, it's much more economical 
and then the company pays for it. That makes it happy for everybody. Um, but then we come out, you, you don't have to go anywhere. It's typically at lunchtime or a time that's good for the employees. We come out and do presentations on all the modules and, and help you out and tell you what to do. And, and it, it builds a lot of camaraderie because you, you know, you've got each other to uh, make sure that you're eating what's on the plan in lunch um, and that kind of stuff. You, you, you hold each other accountable besides just me or somebody else coming out to crack the whip. Yes, ma'am. Nope. 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 No, I think um, what I, I mean, for my kids, uh, the only thing that I did differently was, uh, after, you know, they ate the food that I eat. And then if they want dessert or something like that, I just kind of give them, I let them do it. Especially when they're growing. Because while they're in the process of growing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter um, you know, as long as they're not, as long as they don't have a weight problem, it doesn't really matter because their hormones and their metabolism will just about annihilate anything that, that gets in their way. And so you don't really have to worry about it till about 18, 19 or, or something like that, uh, unless they've, they're overweight or something like that beforehand. Then be strict with, with what they're eating and, and mimicking what you do. And really, it's much easier. The younger you can get them to start eating like you, the, the easier it is. Because the, the old adage is true. I mean, when my kids were, you know, three and six or whatever, they, you know, the, and they would go spend a night at people's house. They'd be like, how do you get your kids to eat vegetables? Well, it's, it wasn't something that I set out to do. It's just that when mommy and daddy eat vegetables, they, they'll, they'll start doing it because it's part of normal. Did I see, wouldn't you? Yes. Yeah. Well, unless, unless they're, unless they're right, unless they're right. I mean, as as long as as long as they're e eating outside of their sugar intake, as long as they're eating healthy, nutritious meals, then some sugar intake on top of that is not going to be harmful. If their breakfast, lunch, and dinner aren't very helpful or healthy, then there's going to be problems. So they you got to make sure they're eating some healthy meals. Um, mostly, and then, you know, some ice cream or candy or something like that, or Smoothie King or something, that's not going to be an issue. But if they're eating, you know, terrible lunch and a not-so-good dinner, well, it doesn't do any good to, you know, to throw a Snickers bar on top of that or a bag of Skittles or something like that. But if they're eating a healthy dinner, then they have, they have a lot more room for error than adults do. Maybe that's a different way to say it. More questions? Well, the, the dreaded words of you can go back to work are, are finally here. <laughs> Thank you.